This time on Lobot Garage, I make some improvement to my service brakes. Hopefully nothing goes sprawling. I make some improvements to my parking brakes. Wonder if that bailing wire will hold up. And I make some improvements to my undercarriage. I've got the little red Jeep back in the lift. Now last time you saw this one was in my Christmas special where I was in a parade and that was in a real mountainous area. As the parade was about to start they had us parked on a hill, pointing downhill, kids in front of me, I had a good chance to think about my brakes. Now you've seen me put a new master cylinder in this already and I replaced a few brake lines in order to get it all working properly so it actually did stop. So we were okay then, but I figured I should do a little bit more than the bare minimum to get them working. And I've had all these brake parts sitting on a shelf for years. I had a little bit of dust on them. So I have new shoes, I have new wheel cylinders, and basically all I need to restore this brake system back to factory original performance. But the problem is, this Jeep was built in the 1940s. Factory original wasn't very good. So I'm just going to completely ignore these parts and let them collect a little more dust. And instead, I'm going to work on what's in this box. Because what we need is more power. We're going to add this harder pack to this Jeep to get power brakes. There's a few ways to do this. This is the main thing. This is the harder pack unit. And these are actually available pretty commonly. And I found them on eBay for right around $200 brand new. I actually went the extra mile here because the way you guys have been supporting me with liking and subscribing, I actually went to a small business up in the Northwest. You may be familiar with them, the guy's known for overdrives, but I bought the complete kit. And this cost me $300 and included a pile of stuff. Now on these Jeeps, the master cylinder is under the floor and the reservoir is cast in in all one piece. And this harder vac unit is supposed to be mounted below the reservoir, which means you're not mounting it in any normal location. You're mounting it way down here. Apparently you can work around it by extending the tube from the reservoir up higher and have a remote mounted reservoir feeding your below mounted reservoir. But I'm gonna see if we have a better option. Now right here we've got the engine, the exhaust pipe, and there is the master cylinder. There's not a whole lot of room to deal with anything here. But the way the hydro vac unit works you just run lines in and out of the unit. It doesn't have to actually be near the master cylinder. Obviously we don't want it in front of the axle because then we could run into stuff as we drive over it. But if we keep going back further, right here we have the brake drum. It has an offset drive shaft off to the side. There's a big hole. And I think this could fit in there somehow. There also is a skid plate. And if this skid plate extended back a little bit, it would cover that up and not lose any ground clearance at all. This Jeep has been beaten on a lot. You can see the skid plate was bent up and the brake drum backing plate folded over to hold it in place. The front of the skid plate is smashed into the uh, bell housing. So this isn't exactly good. So what I'm gonna do is remove this and then we'll figure out some way to install this one. And we already know the fluid is about right around the top of the frame rail. So as long as we keep this unit somewhere in this area, we should be in good shape. Well, we got bolts here that bolt the skid plate right into the bottom of the cross member. They might be a little tricky to get to. There's just a little bit of build up there and bending. I so able to dig this one out. Let's see if it turns. Uh, nope. Nope, wrench just spun on it. So we're gonna do a quicker method. That was better. I'm glad I didn't bother trying to undo that bolt. I really don't think that was coming apart anyway. Looks like there was a little bit of buildup between where the skid plate was and the cross member. Just a few little chunks. Now this Jeep has a transfer case mounted parking brake operated off this lever here. When I first put this Jeep together, I actually bought the cable to operate that. 
But with the skid plate, as mangled as it was, I never could actually get to install it because it goes right on this cross member. We're gonna have all kind of good braking now. Maybe. I happen to have a spare cross member lying around and that has an old parking brake still attached to it. So now I can steal this hardware to attach mine. So this is gonna go something like that. I was looking at this cross member I just took the parking brake cable off of and if I put it right here behind the drum, I'd have a ton of mounting options in that area for this brake booster. And uh, it would be totally protected because it would be all enclosed. My only problem is I still need this for another project, but I think I can copy the shape into something else. I found some pieces of one and a half inch tubing and I put these right up against the frame, then one more to go across. But as I was digging for a piece that was a little bit longer than this one, I ran across some one inch square tubing. And I have a bending die for that. Went a little fancier and made this one. That gives me tons of clearance here, tons of clearance there, matches the shape, and uh, it's right about the same height as this original cross member. And there's a lot of things that are not square under here, so I'm gonna do a little straightening. That's better. These used to be vertical. Can almost measure off them now, which is exactly what I'm gonna do. This unit has two mounting bolts up front, one in the back. It comes with a nice mounting flange that bolts onto these two. That totally won't work for me. I'm just gonna save this for another project. I think what I'm gonna do is take those two bolts and do a straight line down to here with a piece of angle material. And so all I have to do is cut it the right length, pop two holes in it, done. Except there's one more thing we need. Something people don't think about with power brake boosters Air needs to go back in here when you let go of the pedal. That gets air from right here. And you can see there's a little filter. It's got a little clip on it so you can take it out and clean it. Every time you use your brakes, that sucks air in. If you use your Jeep in the dirt, that sucks dirt in too. So that is something to be a concern. If I was driving through water, this would be a real issue, but I'm only driving through dust and dirt and sand. Got a clamp on motorcycle filter, stick that right on the end, so this seems like it'll actually keep dirt out, at least pretty good. You gotta take into account the size of whatever you stick on there when you mount it. I can start taking my measurements for a mounting bracket. I've got my piece of angle that I need cut and I was looking at it and then I changed my mind. That's the bleeder screw. That just has to be on the top so the air escapes. If I kick it out of a bit of an angle, it's still at the top. That gives me a little more ground clearance and makes the angle for my brake lines a little better. Instead of ditching this bracket, I'm going to attach it right there, then angle the whole thing over, and drop all my pieces. I am going to angle this over and drop another piece. Maybe I should bolt some of this stuff on. Put this roughly in this orientation, so it's got a little bit of a twist to it, making sure that I keep that bleeder up, but it's gonna be pointing a little bit sideways. I've got my brackets kind of where I want them, but this clamp is really close to the brake drum. And I could move the whole thing away, but it looks like this is just a V-band clamp. I'm gonna loosen it up and see if I can rotate it. Hopefully nothing goes sprawling. Yep, you can rotate it. Now so far I've had this cross member clamped in place. I've just cut it flush with the frame and I could run a bolt straight up and drill a hole in the frame, uh, which would work fine. Now when you go over bumps with the wheels on either end, the center is gonna wanna go down. So that puts this bottom section in tension and any holes you put in there are gonna weaken it up. Rather than drill a hole from the bottom, I wanna close this off anyway. I cut a piece of strip that's like four inches long or so. I'm gonna cap the tube with that. And then I'm gonna drill holes right in the side of the frame where it's just webbing and it's not as highly stressed. I changed my mind again. I went ahead and bolted this angle to that bracket I was going to weld it together, but I was worried that I might not be able to take it apart once I welded this to the cross member. And that's exactly what happened. There's about three eighths of an inch clearance between this back bolt and the transfer case. These bolts are fixed in the hydrovac. So if I took those nuts off, I couldn't slide it back far enough to take it off this bracket. So if I do need to take it out, I've got to undo these two bolts. But I can, so we're in good shape. 
Now for mounting, all that's left is a bracket on that one bolt. Rather than bend this bracket once at 90 degrees, I'm doing two different 45s. Now unlike modern cars, like from the 60s or so, this body bolts directly to the frame. Pretty much the only flexibility you have is how much the wood inside the body flexes. It's pretty rigidly attached. So now in my mounting system, I have this cross member going to the frame, going to one side. The other side bolt is gonna go up to the body. Even though there's not much flexibility, it could be a little bit of flex. If I did a hard 90 degree angle, pushing up would hit the body. By having the 245s, it'll actually have a little bit of spring and give to it. If there is any flex, it'll flex this bracket, not that hydrovac. Back brackets in, and we are firmly mounted. So now it's time to run the fluid lines and the vacuum line. Now we need to take the master cylinder line and run it backwards, but unfortunately the banjo fitting in this master cylinder has two lines coming out of it. We're gonna have to go to one. And that's gonna go in this fitting here, and then the boosted line comes out here, and that's gotta go into our brake system. But I'm thinking, it doesn't need to go where it used to go at the master cylinder up there. I can run this line right backwards to there. And I'll put a T in here, so that way I have a short little run for that line. I'll just go up and then over, and that'll connect to the whole brake system. And then the old rear line, I'll connect to the front line, connect those two together with a splice, now, of course, I hoard used brake lines also. And I was going through my stash. I have a T-fitting with the right outputs here, but it goes to a rubber hose. So that's not gonna work for me. I have another T-fitting that actually goes to three flare fittings, which is exactly what I need, right diameter, but it's got the European bubble flares on it. This must be from a Volkswagen, and it's a different thread, so that's not gonna work. I could adapt it in and reflare these ends to match the American ones and go to metric ends here, but it's a little bit of a mess doing it that way. This one's the wrong diameter. Everything didn't quite fit. So I think I'm gonna have to break down and buy the proper T. Luckily, while I was digging through, I found a bunch of used pre-made lines. One of them has a union on it. So there's my fitting to connect the front and rear lines at the master cylinder area. That's it for tonight. I gotta run to the parts store and get a T fitting. So we'll pick up again tomorrow. Well, it's a new day and I got a new T. So we can start doing the plumbing. Also, while I was looking at this, I saw on the same rack, they sell little brake line plugs. So I don't have to weld up a fitting and plug off that extra port on the master cylinder. I can uh, just put this in. I splurged, spent the $3.69, got myself a plug. So that saves at least three minutes. I know if it's worth it. The old front and rear lines that went to the master cylinder are now connected together. I've got a plug in one output, and a line going out the other output, and that comes back and feeds into the hydrovac right here. Then the line coming out of the hydrovac is going this way. Now, I was looking at this line, it looks pretty old. I was worried about bending it. So I put this T, so all I have to do is move this line down. I don't have to flex that one at all, and I'll make a new line that goes this way back up. Got the original line moved down with a minimum of bending. Had to make up a little curly Q line. I think that's it for our fluid lines. We just need a vacuum line and bleeding. Now here on the intake manifold, there's two potential ports. There's a little vacuum port right up there, little eighth inch pipe plug, and it looks like a quarter inch pipe plug here. I'm gonna go with the bigger one because uh, obviously larger means more power. And since we want more power on our brakes, that's gotta be the exact one I need. Hmm, that's in there pretty tight. There we go. Apparently the fitting needed more power too. Now in all the hydrovac systems I've worked on before, there's a check valve in them. I didn't get one with this system. I asked the seller about it. He said it's not needed. Also, a vacuum tank came with a kit. I asked the seller about that too because the port on it was um, broken and the wrong size. But he said I didn't need it at all if I wasn't using windshield wipers. Now in my white Jeep, I always like driving it with the windshield folded down, which is just better. If you don't have doors, I don't really see the point in a windshield anyway. But the problem is you can't open your hood with the windshield folded down. Every time I wanted to open the hood, I had to go through the tedious process of putting the windshield up, and that just took forever. So the best solution, I think, is just not having a windshield. You get the open air feeling of your windshield being down, but you heat your hood real easy. Best of both worlds. No need for windshield wipers. So we're not installing this either. So I'm going to fish this vacuum line way down there. Going to go behind the steering box to keep it away from the exhaust. There we go. We got a vacuum connection. 
And I'm sure I'll zip tie all this in position sometime a few years from now after it hits the exhaust. Now while I've got it down on the lift, I gotta remember to stuff this e-brake cable through the dashboard. Cause that's where these emergency brakes went. Now this has little notches on it. That's what actually locks the emergency brake in. Basically these notches keep it from going in unless you turn it to the side. So that means I've got to turn it to the side to get it to fit. All right, new straight. That's not working. Am I missing something here? Okay, you guys are a lot smaller than me when you're in camera form. So you're going under that dashboard to see what's wrong with the emergency brake. I can't even see where I'm pointing the camera, so I'm just gonna sweep it around a little bit, and hopefully the problem shows up. There should be some kind of spring-loaded ratchet deal that uh, catches those teeth. Hopefully uh, we can see it and figure out what to do about it. I'll watch the video afterwards and see what's wrong and if I'm actually gonna fix it. We'll get to that later. Now these are the clamps that hold that emergency brake cable in. The tabs are actually different widths. I spent a long time trying to get this one to fit, that tab is narrower. Hopefully this one works, because this one doesn't. And here's the bracket where the tab goes. And, oh, yeah, it fits right on. This is definitely easier with the right part. Maybe I should try that first next time. And I lost my socket. Where did it go? I didn't hear it hit the ground. That's never a good sign. Never found the old socket. I'm onto a new one now. Luckily I got spares. It's like using chopsticks. You gotta use different fingers for different things. Gotta get this emergency brake cable attached. Let me show you. That's the size hole that tab fits in. So now I can actually clamp that down. I'm missing something that attaches this to this, but I can always make something. I don't think I've used bailing wire yet today. Now in order to make sure there's a truly professional hookup, I'm going to use safety wire pliers on the bailing wire. There. We just bend that out of the way. We might have an emergency brake. Well, here's the end of my vacuum line. I had just enough to get to this fitting here. This fitting actually can rotate so you can clock it where you want. Got my hose hooked up. So I'm going to start the bleeding process, which happens right here. All right, apparently I need a tool to remove the little plastic cap. There we go. Crack this bleeder open. And I'm thinking it's a 10 millimeter. Hmm. Yep, 10 millimeter bleeder. For some reason, nothing seems to be coming out. Well, the other way to try it is using the pedal and pumping the fluid out. So let's give that a shot. see fluid dripping, tightened up that fitting, and it looks like I see some bubbles. What is wrong with this thing? Huh. Now I installed this HydroVac with the caps in place. I never actually looked inside them, I just put fittings in. Now I'm looking at the end that I can actually see that is definitely not the inverted flare that I'm using. Remember how I had a T-fitting, but I didn't want to use it because I had the bubble flares on it, and I wanted to keep everything inverted flare? I should have checked the HydroVac to see if it actually used the same fittings as the rest of the Jeep. I just assumed when you buy a kit for a Jeep, it has the same kind of flare. Now I just gotta figure out if it's too much flare or too little flare. Let's talk for a minute about flares. This here is the inverted flare, that this Jeep and most American vehicles have used for, you know, decades. And then notice the center goes in. Now on the European version, they use the bubble flare, which actually sticks out a bit. Here's the T-fitting I didn't use. This is from a Volkswagen. I don't know if you can see in there, but there is no piece sticking up. It actually is a cone pointing downwards. For comparison, this is what the fitting should look like. That little piece in the center actually sticks up and the flare goes over it and that's what does the sealing. If you don't have that little piece in the center sticking up, an inverted flare will not seal. There's two key things to these flare fittings. You've got the actual flare, the shape that's pushed into the end of the tube, and you have the threaded fitting. You have to make sure that threaded fitting fits your threads and that flare seals in the bottom. 
Welcome to day three of my, this should only take me a couple hours, brake booster install. Went to the parts store again. This time I got a European line with the bubble flare. Of course this is a European line which means the fitting is metric, so that will not fit the booster. I can't use these fittings at all. Now I'm sure there's lines out there that have the standard American nut and a bubble flare, but my parts store didn't carry them. Now that doesn't really matter a whole lot because this bubble flare is only going to be one end of the line. I still have to go to my brake system, which uses the inverted flares. I got an extra long line. I'm going to cut it into two pieces, use the bubble flare on one end, make a new flare on the other end. Hopefully this will get going someday. Now I replaced this line that goes in with a pre-made bubble flare, because that's the one that was leaking real bad. This one I haven't changed yet, so I expect this one will leak. I just hope that one doesn't. Looks like we might actually be okay up there. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this fitting out in the same manner. So let me show you the step-by-step -step here. This is a pre-made line. Gotta get rid of this metric fitting. Now these American fittings did come with the brake booster kit, so I'm gonna use those. I've gotta put a fitting and a flare on this end. We gotta talk about flaring for a minute. There's just a regular flare, which is a single flare. We basically take the end and you spread it out. We have our tubing clamped into the block. Then we drive that cone into the tube. And then you can see the shape in the die. We pop this thing out of here. And you can see the end is pushed outwards. Now the key thing here is that end, when it's spread out, it gets thinner. And this will work for sealing for low pressure stuff. Like uh, fuel lines where you're looking at 10 PSI or so, uh, that would be fine. Brakes are many hundreds of PSI. Some are over a thousand. So this will not work for brakes. What I have here is a tool that holds two different dies. This is the first step. You see a little pin in there. The pin in the center keeps the tubing from collapsing and forces it to barrel out a bit. So you end up with a lump at the end. So we have a clamp block the same way we did with the previous flare. We have the tube sticking out a little bit. We have our die that actually is gonna make the bulge. So we'll do that first. They have a lot of different styles of tools. I actually don't particularly like this one but it's the one I have, so that's what I'm using. So now we basically just have a lump at the end. And I've used this technique a lot for putting a piece of uh, rubber tubing and a hose clamp on a tube. It's a nice little bead on the edge. Now on some flaring tools, the die will actually put in the proper 120 degree angle for the bubble flare. That's the way it's supposed to look. My tool does not form it correctly. I tried to do this and see if I can get it to work. It did not seal. But if your tool does have the right shape on it, you would be done at this point for a bubble flare. In order to turn this into a double flare, we have to shove a cone in it. Now I'm set up to do the 45 degree angle with a 90 degree included angle of the SAE style you'll see on brake lines. If we were doing a hydraulic line or an AN type line, we'd be using this 37 degree cone and that would make a different flare. But for brake lines, we're using the 45. So we drive our cone in there, pop it out, and we should be done. All right, and there we have a double flare. This actually seals in the same kind of shape as that first flare we did. This is called the double flare because by expanding the material and then folding it back into itself, that edge is a double layer of thickness. So that is a lot stronger for the high pressure we see on brakes. Now I replace this line with the bubble flare on this end and the double flare on this end. And hopefully we could be leak free, maybe? Let's find out. Now that's an issue. Feels pretty tight. Let's go a little more. I just hope it doesn't start loosening. Okay, I don't see any more fluid pouring out, so let's bleed the brakes. I got a lot of air on the system. Probably not all, but uh, should be good enough to give it a try. We'll see if we have extra power. Now one of the tests they said to check to make sure it's working is you press down on the pedal, then start the engine and see if the pedal moves with the engine. It moves up. This is a little weird. You press down, it goes down, and then it comes back up. That's a little strange. Well, the first test drive was a success. The brakes worked. They're definitely easier than they were before. They're not really overpowered. I actually was expecting a lot more power boost. 
but it, it's fairly mild. You could tell it's happening, but basically they just feel like brakes should have fell anyway. Now while I was out testing it out, I worked on straightening out my skid plate the usual method. But apparently, this skid plate's strong enough that driving the Jeep over it doesn't do anything. So I had to go and use some bodywork techniques. And that seemed to work well. Surprisingly though, even that didn't knock all this stuff off. So I'm going to get the last bit of dirt off here, or grease, or whatever new substance it has become and then reattach this skid plate. Now I know this is not going to protect that hydrovac. So I went digging my pile of parts. I found a piece of skid plate. Someone's cut the whole front end off of this one, but it's basically the same thing. It's that part of the original one. So I'm going to uh, see if I can make a back section out of this piece, then I'll protect it for the booster unit too. And here's our final result. The original skid plate's back in place, then in my new cross member, I was able to line up two holes, bolted it to the other one with a little bit of a spacer because this cross member is just a little bit higher, uh, which is fine, more ground clearance. And I was able to use the angle that was cut in the plate to make sure I have brake drum clearance on the parking brake. And, hey, that reminds me, we never tried out the parking brake. Wonder if that bailing wire will hold up. Now normally this is the part where I take out all the stuff I just built and uh, finish up any welds that I couldn't get to while I was in here and paint everything. But I'm not going to do that for a very specific reason. That's coming out again in a few weeks. Because just this morning I ordered a new set of gears for the transmission with a lower ratio first gear. So that transmission's coming out, the skid plate's coming off, I'll take care of painting it then. For now we get to enjoy this thing. Which means now we need a road test. Works great. See if we can adjust this, move that tab over a little. Now let's give it a shot. Perfect. Twist and push in. Just like a parking brake should. speeds it just feels like the brakes normally work. But once I was on the road I would come up to stop signs that I've come up to before and I felt myself surging forward it was braking a lot more than I was expecting it to. Definitely a big improvement particularly on the road which is really where you need it the most. And it doesn't feel overpowered for slow speed use. So that's a good setup right there. I'm pretty happy with it. I had a lot of fun road testing this thing. It wasn't quite as much fun dealing with all the leaks and the fittings. Really that's my own fault. I did it wrong. I didn't look to see what fitting I needed, I just assumed it was the same as the regular Jeep. If I had looked, I would have known. Next time I'll know better. Hopefully if you're watching this, you don't have to make the same mistakes I did. And I hope you're having fun with your projects too. We'll see you next time.